So this week has been uh, one of great stress in many ways. One praying that the Supreme Court would rule that Roe versus Wade was not uh, proper and know that there's a number of people who are very stressed out about this. So we need to pray for those who are stressed out in opposition, but we thank God that he has turned the tide. Um, one thing in a, in a country like ours, we can differ on issues, but we're still the same country. And we need to have a discourse where we're positive even in the midst of trials. But, um, you know, we've prayed for this long and hard, and only God could have made this change. And we rejoice in that. Um, so what I've decided to do, I'm going to do a study, and we're going to start at Genesis chapter 1 and go all the way through the Bible. Now, I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of the whole Bible, but I'm going to go through and pick out major events as we come through the Bible and cover those. Just like you rarely get a uh, sermon on uh, the minor prophets other than Jonah and Malachi, and the others are kind of ignored. And so I'll, as we get to those books, I'll just do the whole book at one time, but give you the major impact from that. And so it'll be an interesting study as I journey through that. And um, I'm not going to stay, uh, get bogged down in just doing verse by verse because that would, that would take forever. Uh, but I want to do a study because what I'm doing is you go back to the foundation where our faith began and see what's there is what's called progressive revelation. We know just a little bit in Genesis about what's coming. We know we're going to be blessed. We don't know how it's going to be, but we know it's going to come. And as you see more and more through Scripture, and then you come to Jesus who says, hey, I've got a new covenant over here, and you go through the New Testament, then it comes to light. And so therefore, we're going to go back to where it all began and then move forward, and it will be enlightening how God works with his people. Sometimes you feel like, well, God, God gave up on me. No, God won't give up on you. God you know, threw me away. No, God doesn't throw you away. People throw you away. God doesn't. People give up on you. God doesn't. He, God loves you and cares for you and deeply wants you to change your life to match his ideals. And he's got great plans for us. And he's got great blessings. Yes, we, in church we talk about a lot blessings in heaven, but God has blessings here. You know, just look around the room. We are incredibly blessed compared to much of the world. Incredibly blessed. And so we need to remember that, how God's moved in our hearts and given us opportunities we know not of at all. And the, so the first thing we need to look at is God is our creator. God is our creator. See, when you have something, that you say, well, it just sort of happened. And uh, there was no design, it just happened by chance. The chances of that are just even greater than if you have a creator. You realize that. God is mentioned in chapter 1 of Genesis 32 times in just 43 verses. So that's a lot. And the Holy Spirit must be trusted as he guided through all of this so that we get it right. So just think about this. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So before man ever stepped forth on the earth, before there was any air to breathe, and we kind of need that, when there was no, before there was land to stand on, the dawning of time took place. God created, consider this, it's like a hammer onto an anvil. God created, period. Atheism is out the window. You know, at the very beginning it says God created. So it's not just science or something else going on. No, God specifically created. And evolution is banished to the, roast, to the heap because man did not evolve from something else. God says, I made man. Here's the trouble with uh, science They've yet to find a link between one species to another. 
They've tried many different ways, like one thing, they tried using beetles to try to, because they have short durations, and so you can make a whole lot of them, and they keep on reproducing, 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 and what are they good? More beetles. They didn't change from one species to another, it's still the same. You know, but when you think about that, God loves variety. God loves, you know, color and light and glory. So it's all out there. So God's truth is given full credit for all of creation there. The word created is the, is the Hebrew word bara, which means created from nothing. Only God can create something from nothing. You know, we say, well, I made this. Well, yeah, you took materials that are already here and you put it together in a different way, but you didn't create it. You manufactured whatever. So it talks about the heavens and the earth. With the continued preciseness of the text, it avoids getting down in um, minor issues and so forth. He stays on the major issues. What happened? Simply, God created the heavens and the earth. Period. Now, you would think, well, where did he get this from? Now, the intelligentsia of the day, when Moses was there, and he, as he penned this, in Egypt, where he was from, the Egyptian myth was there was a primeval ocean and um, there appeared to be an egg. And the egg produced the sun god. And the sun god, who is Ray, by the way, produced four children, Gab, Shu, Tough Nut, and Nut. That's a lot of nuts to me. <laughs> and if you were an intelligent person of that day in Egypt, that's what you believed, and... Pharaoh, who felt he was a descendant of Ray, the sun god, he thought he was a god too. But of course, they made tombs and put them in because they were dead. In, in Babylon, if you went over to Iraq where Babylon is, the thought of the day of how everything was created, that there was gods and there was plot and counterplot and fighting between the gods, banquets and rivalry and war between the gods which resulted on earth. That was their thought of how everything was created. And the Greeks, the mystical atlases, huge individuals that would fight and so forth and would be with men and women and back and forth and always fighting. But everyone's fate was in the hands of three fates that made all the decisions. That's where that comes from. And what about the Hindus? The world rested on the back of three elephants, okay? And these three elephants were upon a giant tortoise that swam on the sea. Now, scientists, though, have confirmed that the world, that the things happen in the order listed in Genesis. So consider. First of all, the universe was formed verse 1, then there was light in verse 3, and then the third thing, this, it's spelled darkness in verse 4. Then 4, the atmosphere came, verse 6, and 7, that there were plants down in verse 11. Then in number 8 was sun, moon, and stars, and that's verse 14. 9 was marine life in verse 20. 10, there was fowls of the air, verse 21. 11, the age of monsters, verse 24. 12, the land of vertebrates, verse 24. And 13, verse 26, man. Now, Peter Stoner, a mathematician, determined it would be a one and six tenth, six, six trillion chance, that's 21 zeros, okay? One and 21 zeros behind it, that Moses could get it right that he would have picked all of these in the order that they happen as confirmed by science. You would have to have 8 million printing presses producing 2,000 
cards a minute each, running day and night for five million years, and you had the whole stack of cards there, and by chance you picked one card out of it, and it was a one card marked. Yeah, one to sex trillion. That's one with 21 zeros. And yet, he went totally against the intelligentsia of the day, and he got it right. Who else but God could give that wisdom to anyone to get it right like that? In John 1.1 1, 1 in the New Testament, in the beginning was the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, again, in John, it's crystal clear again. The Bible is making it clear that before the world was ever anything happened, the world was. That's why Jesus could say, before Abraham was, I am. And see, that goes back to Moses when, God, when Moses asked God, well, who are you at the burning bush? He says, I am who I am. I am the great I am. And here, when Jesus is introduced by John, he is the Word, the Logos, the one who is always. Now in verse 2 of John chapter 1, he existed in the beginning with God. So Jesus wasn't created after God. No, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three, and yet they're one. It's interesting, we in English have come up with the word Trinity, and we go, there's some scholars say, oh, Trinity is not in the Bible. True. The word Trinity isn't, but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are. So you can take it whichever way you want, but there's three that are one God. Oh, you got three gods? No. There are three, and yet they're one. Just as H2O is water, liquid water you drink. But water is also, if you freeze it, it's ice that can make your water cold. And it can also stop a, a liner in the water. But also you can heat it up real hot in your kettle. You know, I've got a kettle on my stove. People come look at my cooktop and I've got a kettle on it. That kettle has never had any water in it. <laughs> but if I put water in it, I could heat it up and it could produce steam and that's H2O. So it's three ways, and yet it's still the same thing. That's God. In John 1, 3, God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. So what do we find in Genesis? The word is spoken, and everything's created. And who's doing that? Jesus, the Son of God. So everything is created by God. Jesus. So you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit there, and Jesus speaks into existence. Just as when he was going to be arrested, and Peter wanted to go fight. He pulled out his sword and cut the man's ear off, and Jesus puts the ear back on. And he says, don't you know I could call 10,000 legions of angels here? You know, put your sword away. You know, all Jesus had to do was speak the word, and it was done. And John 1, 4. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. Without light, what happens? Nothing lives. You can have light to live. You've got to have light for the photosynthesis, photosynthesis and the plants for it to grow. You need light to get vitamin D so your body can be healthy. You've got to have light. And you, what? You have to have light to see. I remember once I was visiting my aunt and uncle in Paris, Texas, because he, Alton Smith, my uncle, was working with his father at the John Deere dealership in Paris, Texas. And so it was night, and we were playing hide-and-go-seek. There wasn't much light outside. And my cousin Rob reminded me of this. I ran smack into a telephone pole. <laughs> Wham! It was dark. I, could, I didn't see it. It just blended in with the dark. you got to have light to see. And so that ended 
Now, I get back up, and I'm ready to go, and of course, my aunt comes out. What happened to you? Well, I just ran to the telephone, but boys, get in the house. <laughs> Smack, yeah. He reminded me of that on our trip. Hmm. Verse 5, and it says, Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. You know, the world has tried to put out God's light. It's tried to burn Bibles. It's tried to eradicate about Jesus. Uh, so many don't even want to talk about it. They want to just shove it to the side and think that's something past. And you know what? God never quits. No matter what the world tries to do to put God away, it, He always remains. So the light shines in the darkness. You know, evil, some people, are, they focus on the troubles and the evil in the world, and there's a lot there, but I focus on the light because God is light, and he will never be extinguished by the darkness, so you don't back down, you stay strong, you don't give up, you don't quit, you don't focus on evil, you focus on God. Now, you need to be aware of evil happening so you can deal with it, but it's not your, your primary focus because God will get you through those dark times. In Genesis verse 1, verse 3, let me give you a whole, run this all together. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night, and evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. Do you realize darkness was in control until the light came? Light, br light brings life. It sustains life. It develops life. Darkness can't extinguish it. And so God allows the darkness so that our world can properly be. You know, he allow you know it's interesting. Our world turns just the right speed so that we don't get too hot. Now, we're complaining about 100 degrees. But you know, if it went just a little bit slower, it would be hotter. And if it went faster, it would be real cold where you couldn't even live up north. It goes, turns on just the right speed on its axis. And then it turns just the right time during the summer solstice. That's when the northern hemisphere was closest to the sun. And now... Our days are starting to get shorter after the 22nd, so it's shorter days, all the way until the earth turns where the southern hemisphere is closest to the sun. Do you realize if these things didn't happen at the speed they are, we would either freeze or burn up? And just think about it. If there wasn't a moon, the tides would not be there as they should be for the world to be right. And if any of those things were off uh, just a little bit, we could not exist. And when people talk about various changes in the environment and so forth, if you look through history, the environment has changed throughout history. And God's been in charge, and the world keeps turning. But if the world would, would make any of those changes, we'd be gone, and there's nothing we could do about it. God has created life, and God sustains life, and God has the last word about life on this planet. Now, the second thing from that is Adam and Eve. They were just like us. You go, what? Yes, Adam and Eve were just like us. They're the prototypes. You think about it. The first man and woman created they had to be stunning. They had to be brilliant. They had to have their act together. Because from them, all of us came. So, you know, whether you like it or not, I'm your relative. <laughs> We're all related, whether you like it or not. We came from Adam and Eve. There they are. So the bottom line of that is I got a bunch of things. God created humanity. We didn't create ourselves. God created us. And I'm going to tell you right now, as I go through the second half of my message, 
I'm going to repeat, I'm going to use verses again a couple of times. You say, why? I'm a good teacher. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you again. I'm going to tell you until you got it right. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Who's this? Us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry all around the ground. Verse 27. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for a man to be alone. I agree with that. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So pray for that. Now as we look at this, the Bible makes it clear that evolution, man didn't come from a different species. He was created separate, different from any other species. And God chose to make him from the dust of the ground. And as they scientists analyze the body, yep, you have all kind of materials that came from the earth. And here we are. And notice, God breathed life into that body. I've been beside the bedside of many people who've passed away. And once that last breath is gone, they're gone. No one's home. That body is simply a tent. Their spirit is long gone once they pass away. Notice atheism in all this is brushed aside. Evolution is brushed aside. God in his wisdom and power created, and he didn't evolve from something else, but was created separate from all of the rest of creation. Now, the other thing is God makes us responsible See, we're responsible to God for how we live on our, this planet. Now back to verse 27. So God created the human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Then he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Now we've done a very good job of that. Being fruitful and multiply, that was what God wanted. Fill the earth and notice, and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the animals that scurry around the ground. So God wants us to reign over it, but what happens? You're responsible for what you're overseeing so that you care for it, that you nurture it, you don't destroy it. And notice, God created human beings in his own image. So they weren't created after something else. No. In God's image were created. So only man was created in God's image. No other living thing was created in God's image. And we're the one that were given responsibility to govern, not any other part of the creation. And so it's a great responsibility we have. Now look in verse 15. And the Lord placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So he is responsible for taking care of it. Such as I sold a friend of mine, J.W. and Jan, 25 acres of land. And it was really thick, a whole bunch of underbrush and so forth, and there are trees and so forth. And now he's cleaned out the underbrush. You can see the, clear, the trees are now blossoming that much more and spreading out and how much it's made a difference as he's tended to his land. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to manage it man, and take care of it so it flourishes, it doesn't decrease. Now, I'm, you don't want me to have a plant because I, I find a way to kill it. Somebody gave me a nice plant and uh, it didn't seem to be doing all that well. They said, well, it needs more sun. So I put it in my front, and it faces east, and it got too hot and half the thing died. 
So I've drug it back in, and so I put water in it, and apparently I watered too much, and some more of it died. And um, then I thought that it was all dry and needed more water, gave it some more, and it died too. So I'm real good at killing plants. So I'm tending it has not been my, so I'll let other people tend the plants, and I'll be the professional talker. So that works for me. But we're supposed to tend and watch over it. And God gave us a sacred test. Yeah. You know, God loves giving tests. See, God's always trying to teach us something, so he gives us tests. Well, he gave us a big test. Verse 16 of chapter 2 of Genesis. The Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you will surely die. So God doesn't want us to be a string on the puppet, you know, where you can get the marionette and you can run its mouth and do everything. No, God wants to give us freedom. He wants us to choose to love him. He doesn't want us to be forced to love him. It's our choice. But we are accountable to our choices. And so we're not mechanical people. We are moral people. And we get to choose our morals and our ethics, we choose. And if you choose the wrong morals and ethics, you'll suffer consequences from it. It's amazing. Now, verse 31, I mean, verse 3, verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of the wild animals the Lord God made. And one day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Hmm. Verse 2. Of course you may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's the only fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse 4. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit of the, and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with him and, she ate it, and he ate it too. Notice, he didn't have the conversation. He's, she said, here's the fruit, eat it. <laughs> Typical guy. Here's what's on your plate. You got to eat it, okay? It's gone. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and suddenly they felt shame of their nakedness. They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Now, so the first ingredient of sin. So we've looked where God came in. We look where man's come in, and we go, okay, what's the next thing? Sin. Hmm. So it's real fruit, a real man, a real woman. Now, sometimes when we get to Moses... And we get to the Red Sea where the nation of Israel crossed through on dry ground through the Red Sea. There's some scholars say, oh, well, that was the Reed Sea. So it went very deep. Well, actually, it's a greater miracle if it was the Reed Sea than the Red Sea. You say, why? Because the Egyptian army that followed after them drowned. It would be easier to drown in, an, in the Red Sea than in the Reed Sea, which was only three inches of water. That'd be a greater miracle. He could get them to drown in three inches of water. So you're only making it better, not worse, by saying that. The point of truth is conveyed is always more powerful. Now, who's the blame? Eve. Now, believe me, she was a really attractive woman. I mean, she's the prototype of all women. She is absolutely knocked down gorgeous woman. And she's intelligent, brilliant. Nothing gets by her. Now, the serpent, it's apparently it was alluring and beautiful, but I don't know if it flew or walked or what, but it's the exact opposite where it is now on the ground. But this one was inhabited by Satan, so it was not a normal one. But if I run into a snake, it's not going to last long. But both Adam and and Eve were responsible for their actions. 
No, sin does not become a sin until we act on it. Jesus was tempted and he didn't sin. You can say yes or no to sin. It's your choice. Do I go in or do I not? We are all responsible for our actions, right or wrong. Now, here are the opportunities. We all have the same opportunities. We all can be tempted in our lives. You know, you can say, well, I'm a monk. I'm retreated to the side. I'm away from the world. Well, you can wind up with the pride of life thinking you're better than everybody else because you retreated from everybody else. Instability in the world is out there. But God's out there too. Just know that. No. When Jesus was tempted, he, after he was baptized by John in the river, he was taken out into the desert. And each time he was questioned, he would say, it is written, and would quote the scripture. Now it says for 40 days, and 40 nights he was there. And then Satan went away after he was defeated. But here's the thing. We have three of the things he was tempted about, but he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. So these are just the three high ones. It's not the others. What were the three sins he dealt with? Three kinds of sin. And all sin fits in one of these three categories. You got lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. All sin fits in one of those categories. Um, so the... The lust of the flesh is an inordinate desire for food or sex. Lust of the eye, seeing everything you want and trying to accomplish, get everything, even if whether you need it or not. And the pride of life, the propensity to build the world around yourself. So Jesus was prepared and confronted sin when he said, oh, turn these stones into bread. He said, he said it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He took him on a high view. We could see all the kingdoms of the world at that time. He says, I'll give you these kingdoms if you'll bow down and worship me. He said, thou shalt not. Uh, that, he said, thou shalt only worship the Lord God himself and only worship him. Then he took him on the pinnacle of the temple, the very top of the temple, way up high. He says, just jump. Now Satan starts quoting scripture. That's why you need to know scripture. He says, Satan says it's written that he will give his angels charge over you and will not allow your feet to be dashed against the rocks. And Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt not presume upon the Lord thy God. So Satan finally left him. He was defeated. I want you to know sin always begins with a question. Look at back in Genesis 31 verse, I mean, chapter 3 verse 1. I keep on calling chapter 3 verse 1, 31. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God made. And one day asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit or from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that? He raises the question, puts doubt in your mind. You got to really say that, or maybe you know you misunderstood it. So sin begins with a question, and the second word there is consideration. Hmm. Of course, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. The woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. it. If you do, you will die. So she's, instead of saying, oh, she's, there's some consideration going on. Then the third thing that happens is lies. Watch out for lies. Genesis 3, 4 you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Notice a lie. You won't die. 
We won't die right now, but you will eventually die because the mortality rate of the human race is 100%. You will die. But, you know, it's, it's like sometimes God changes the date of expiration on us. Yeah. Right here, yeah, he changed the date. He said, you haven't gotten done enough on this world, Max. You've got more work to do. Then you have participation. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and wanted the wisdom it gave to her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Again, I said, you know, typical man. Oh, the wife fixed the dinner. Okay, here it is. And we just eat it up. Did it happen? Yes. Who did it? We all did it. You say, well, if I were there, it'd be different. No, look in your life. It wouldn't have changed anything. We all would have fallen in the same trap. We have opportunity and stability in the world is going on. We have free will. People make bad choices. They say that we're the master of our own will. You have choices. God doesn't want you to be a puppet on a string. He wants you to make your decisions to follow him. And if you choose not to follow him, that's your choice. But you suffer the consequences of that. Here's the alternative if God didn't give us a free will. Either we would just be like the animals or we'd be six feet under. You know, what's your choice? We need to draw on God's power to strengthen and help us as we go through life. And we need to accept Jesus as our Savior. The most important decision you'll make in life is Jesus as your Savior. Now you say, well, where's that tree of life? Genesis chapter 3, verse 23. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden and sent, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You say, hmm, scientists have figured out that the tree of life was most likely over in present-day Iraq, around the Euphrates River. So we need to go over there and find the tree of life, right? Wrong. Wrong, wrong. It's not there. You say, well, where is it? Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. The angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb of God. It flowed down the center of Main Street. Each side of the river grew a tree of life. So it's not just one, but multiples. Bearing 12 crops of fruit and the fresh crop each month. The leaves were used in medicine to heal the nations. No longer would there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. So incredible opportunity there. When you, because if you accept Jesus as your Savior, when you leave this earth, you're going somewhere. Either a place called heaven where God resides or the place referred to as hell where you don't want to be. And there, notice, it's, it's a wonderful picture. The water flows from the throne of God. The picture is he, he is giving substance to life, joy and happiness by the water. He provides everything. And notice the tree of life is no longer anywhere on this planet. It's in heaven. And there's multiple ones in heaven because God can make as many as he wants. Notice it's for the, the leaves or the healing of the nations. There's going to be people from every ethnic group there in heaven. And he will bring us together, no longer nations of the world, but one kingdom, God's kingdom. You know, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. That's what we pray for. But it won't be until Jesus is here ruling the earth, but I'm looking forward to heaven because he's totally in charge. And notice 
a fresh crop every month. You don't have to wonder, well, I've got to wait until next year for another crop. I've got to preserve it. No, there's plenty all the time. Provisions are incredible in heaven. And no, no, it's no longer will be a curse upon anything. There will be no sin in heaven. Won't that be great? It'll be totally different than the world we're in. You realize the world we're here is a class by God. And he teaches us all the way through life. And we have victories. We have defeats. We have failures. We have opportunities. We produce and accomplish things. And all the way along, we learn what not to do and what to do. As we learn and we draw closer to God through that. See, all the things that happen ought to draw us closer to God and to know God more. That's the real purpose. If you make money or if you have an opportunity or things are going well, those are a blessing beyond. His main purpose is for us to know Him. And the more you know Him, the more of His love, His care, how God is light, there's no darkness in Him. He's not looking to crush you and beat you up. No, He's looking to love you, encourage you. But He's not going to continue to bless you when you choose not to do His will. So He'll cut the blessings off and allow us to go forward with our own will and suffer the consequences. But you know what? Unlike other people who will give up on you, throw you away, say you're, not, you're worthless, you're trash, God doesn't throw anyone away. He doesn't give up on anyone. And he has opportunities for you when you come back to him. Boy, you think about it. it the picture of the prodigal son is the picture of all of us. Or some of us are the older brother who was upset that the younger brother got a party. You know, and he's, the both are just equally as lost. You realize that. The one that stayed home, the one that went away, they're both lost. And they both need a Savior. And what happens? A feast is thrown because the one that was lost is now found. God wants you to come home. Make sure you know him. Walk in his grace every day and let him transform your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful passage here in the very beginning of the Bible that caused us to thank and draw close to you and understand this world and all of its inhabitants are here because of you. God created Barah from nothing. Help us to remember that we're here because we're loved greatly by God. Let us choose to make wise decisions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand for this time.